Welcome to episode 80 of the Headspace and Timing Podcast, a show brought to you by the Change Your POV Podcast Network. Today, I'm talking one of the most recognized national experts when it comes to the research behind military, veteran, family member, and caregiver mental health and wellness. As the author or co-author of over 100 books, studies, reports, and journal articles, Terry Tanelian's work as a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation means that she knows and understands a lot when it comes to the mental health and wellness of those who served or serve our nation and those who support them. If we've learned anything from the studies that have been done following the cohort of Vietnam era veterans is that we can expect to see you know, several uh, years, decades um, before some of the symptoms really reach a level of um, functional impairment um, such that veterans may come forward and seek treatment. So both the delayed onset of the uh, symptoms and disorder, but also probably the delay to getting help um, that we know many veterans have experienced as well. Welcome to the Change Your POV Podcast Network. You're listening to Headspace and Timing, a show dedicated to breaking down the stereotypes about veteran mental health. My name is Dwayne France, and I'm a combat veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. After I retired from the Army, I took on a new mission as a clinical mental health counselor for my fellow service members. If you served in any branch of the military, you're familiar with the M2 machine gun, the 50 cal. It's one of the most effective weapons in the military's arsenal. If the weapon's headspace and timing wasn't set right, however, it was just a huge useless chunk of metal. Veterans can be rendered inoperable if their headspace and timing isn't set correctly either. That's my goal with this show, to change the way that we think and talk about veteran mental health and reduce the stigma against seeking support. Each week, we'll talk with mental health professionals, veterans, and those who support veteran service members and their families. We're going to have real and honest conversations about a topic that most just don't like to talk about, veteran mental health. Let's jump into this week's conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Headspacing Timing Podcast once again. And as always, I really appreciate you taking the time to to listen and learn more about veteran mental health. You know, one of the things that I really enjoy about uh, putting this show together is that I get to uh, reach out and talk to some of the leading voices in veteran mental health. Uh, and that's where my guest is today. Um, I've been following her work for years, essentially even uh, uh, before I came a clinician as an undergrad or as a graduate student, um, specifically looking at the work and the research that's been done around veteran mental health. Uh, and so uh, Terry and the organization that she works with uh, has done a lot to advance the understanding of what we know about veteran mental health and really point us towards some of the questions that we need to be asking. So uh, today's guest is uh, Terry Tanelian from RAND Corporation. Terry, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. No, I, I absolutely appreciate you taking the time. I've uh, um, There are some leading voices in veteran mental health, and uh, I don't know if I could call you a, a veteran mental health maven, um, <laughs> but you are among um, some of the, the, the leading voices, uh, we had Heather Kelly on the show, and of course, uh, Casey Kelly and Marjorie Morrison, and now you. And so I, I know that we all kind of travel in the same circles and, and communicate, um, but definitely like uh, appreciate you being able to, to get the word out to a wider audience. Yeah, no, I'm happy to be here. Great group of women I'm joining to talk about a very important topic. So uh, before we get into your research, uh, I actually had the opportunity to meet you in person um, uh, about a month ago or so and hear how you got involved in veteran mental health research. Uh, and, and it's always interesting to me to, to hear and to find out about how, about how people get involved in this. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to tell the audience um, sort of how you got to where you are now. Sure, and I'll aim for the short story. So I um, am trained as a psychologist and have been doing mental health services research since I left graduate school in the early 90s and really had been focusing on access and quality of mental health services um, across the United States, largely in the civilian private sector, uh, with a special focus on adolescent mental health in particular. Um, did some studies that were really aimed at uh, understanding how psychiatric care and um, both psychiatrists, psychologists, as well as 
social workers and other clinicians were providing um, access to high quality evidence-based treatment for depression and other mental health disorders. I joined the RAND Corporation in 2000 and one of my first projects was really trying to help finish up studies that we were doing at the time, looking at the potential causes of Gulf War illness. And um, the one uh, report that I worked on most uh, especially was looking at the psychological and psychosocial consequences of deployment among troops and understanding the history and what we have learned over time throughout various conflicts and deployments about how service members were impacted and what that meant for their mental health. Um, that was 2000. Obviously, September 2001 um, was an important event uh, in our nation's history that really catapulted um, an understanding of how trauma affects um, everyone and uh, soon began doing studies looking at how our troops were faring uh, with the deployments in Afghanistan and with the deployments to Iraq. And so really uh, changed the focus of my career to uh, be most um, focused on understanding how combat and deployment-related trauma um, was affecting our troops and their families psychologically, psychosocially, uh, what the impact was uh, for the experience of mental health conditions, and what the potential long-term consequences were, and then really focused on how we could address them with better services and systems of care to address um, barriers, but also mitigate the consequences of the trauma that they experienced in theater. So, and that's, uh, it's very fascinating to me because you've essentially been looking at the entire arc of these these last 17, 18 years um, uh, from where we started in uh, veteran, military and veteran mental health uh, to where we're at now. And, and I, I assume, or I know even from what I've seen, first experiencing it and now as a clinician, uh, the change in that. Uh, but even more interesting, I, I think, to me, is really the work that you did um, with, with the Gulf War. Um, you know, we've, we, we talk about Vietnam veterans, we talk about post-9-11 veterans, and, and a lot of the Gulf War veterans that I talk to now almost feel like Korean War veterans, that it's the forgotten war in between the two big ones. So it's, it's essentially the current era. Uh, but I served in the in the early 90s with many Gulf War veterans. Most of the, the uh, veterans that I served with were Gulf War veterans. And it was an issue because the, the, the toll was different. It was a shorter war, but it was about 100 hours of sustained conflict, especially for those veterans that were sort of tip of the spear. How do you see the differences between sort of the impact of Gulf War in the mental health space to what you're seeing now with post 9-11 veterans? So that's a great question. And um, when we were doing the studies, you know, we were trying to understand the potential causes of Gulf War um, illness and, and, you know, the multi multiple idiopathic symptoms that a number of um, Gulf War veterans were experiencing. So there were very few kind of large scale assessments of the psychological impact, if you will, among that a cohort of veterans. And so I don't have great data on the specific rates of post-traumatic stress disorder or anxiety or other issues in that population. But what really changed as a result of the experiences uh, that Gulf War veterans um, had was how we conduct our surveillance of troops, both while they're in theater to monitor for exposures, uh, both those that are physical as well as um, psychological in terms of environmental hazards. Um, remember, you know, there were concerns about oil well fires and exposure to depleted uranium. And so we really changed how surveillance was conducted, um, both in theater and then as folks came home. So our post-deployment health assessments uh, and our post-deployment health capabilities really were formed as a result of the experience, um, informed obviously by history with Vietnam and Korea, um, but really as a result of what was happening with Gulf War, um, Gulf War uh, veterans and, and what the troops experienced. And so the biggest shift we've seen is really the military's um, footprint in how it tries to monitor for um, trauma, how it tries to address and implement programs, both pre-deployment uh, as well as how it um, changed and, and rapidly shifted over time 
the footprint of psychological support in theater, but then also how it has conducted assessments once troops came home. Um, over time, obviously, we've seen even greater changes since the early deployments in 2001, 2, 3, and 4, um, with how we also provide support to families and thinking about the ripple effect and the psychological impact um, that having a loved one deployed to a combat theater can have on the family as well. So, and that's something interesting, and I don't know if this research uh, has been done, um, but one of the things that I've seen, especially with the veterans that I work with now, and even I experience personally, um, is that connectivity with the home front is much greater now uh, than it was um, even in Gulf War, and definitely uh, when I first deployed uh, to Bosnia in 1996, we were writing letters, right? We didn't have the email thing. Uh, I wasn't married at that time, but I remember, you know, letters from home, letters from my mother and my sister. Um, but now, um, when when troops are deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the connectivity is almost in instantaneous with Skype. Um, you know, obviously there's uh, uh, there's uh, security concerns and things like that. Uh, but my second deployment to Afghanistan, which was not a, a combat deployment at all, essentially, um, uh, I, was, uh, I was on a training team and the latrine was in the same building I slept in. I talked to my wife twice a day um, because that's the kind of deployment that particular one was. I, I, do you think that makes a difference or, or has there been research done on that difference um, in relationships either during deployments or, or how things have impacted that post-deployment? Yeah, sure. And it's been an interesting, right? So I think anecdotally, people have expressed concerns that on the one hand, um, that communication can be great and that it keeps the family connected and the kids can still hear their deployed parents' voice. Um, on the other hand, it also brings the stress and strain of the spouse back home to the service member on the battlefield. And so I think people have been concerned um, about both the protective as well as the risk um, factors that it might introduce um, for either a uh, member of the couple, but also in, within the family. Um, but communication and expectations around communication um, are important. In fact, we did a study uh, where we followed close to 3,000 military families across a deployment cycle. Um, we were able to interview them at multiple time points across um, a three-year period. And so we had pre-deployment um, data on a range of outcomes of interest. And we were trying to understand how the families fared um, across a deployment cycle so that we could understand and empirically observe what um, processes and what factors may be associated with those that seem to do well, as well as um, those that don't seem to do as well. And so one of the really striking findings that we observed um, at the end of our longitudinal analyses was really that the frequency of communication, as well as the expectations around the frequency of communication, was a protective factor um, with respect to uh, relationships within the family. And so those that had um, kind of communicated as frequently as they expected to communicate um, seemed to do better than those that weren't able to communicate um, as they had anticipated or expected. And so it wasn't necessarily that you had to talk a lot or communicated a lot, um, but that you were communicating kind of at the frequency um, that you had planned to. And that turned out to be protective for um, family uh, relationship outcomes. Now, uh, you know, this was a time period and it, it, you know, it's hard to generalize these findings because we studied deployments between 2012 and 2015. And certainly that was a very different um, type of uh, security environment um, in Afghanistan and Iraq than deployment, say, for example, between 2003 and 2008. And so it's difficult to generalize those findings. Um, 
We also know that the the military troops that have been deploying um, more recently and certainly in that time period um, have had greater experiences. Many of them, this was um, not their first deployment. And so many of the families had developed the coping skills, if you will, um, to endure the separations um, and kind of set up the expectations around communication, um, knowing um, that they could keep in touch because of technology and because of the location and um, specific responsibilities of their loved one in theater. No, I, I really, uh, I recognize that, especially it being a study in the later years of the conflicts. As you were talking, I was thinking uh, of how uh, my my three combat um, tour progression went. Um, it was much more challenging, I guess, sort of the reintegration after my first one, which essentially was a 15, that was one of the 15-month tours. It was longer. It was the first deployment that my, my wife and I had experienced together. Um, the the expectation of communication was greater and we didn't get that. We didn't speak as mm -hmm. often as the expectation was there. Then when I deployed to Afghanistan the next time, we knew what to deal with. We knew what the expectation was and we communicated at the level that we expected. And so I, right. I anecdotally, I see that. And that was a thing that, you know, by 2011, 12, especially, I mean, even if they were, you know, a mid-career NCO or, or, you know, company grade officer, um, they likely had been on two or three deployments and that expectation was there. And so it might seem to be something that could indicate for future uh, conflicts to be able to include that in pre-deployment awareness, exactly. you know, exactly. and, and so it's something that can be a protective factor. Exactly. And that was kind of the point of this particular study was to try to understand um, what could be done to both prepare families um, to manage the transition to deployment, but also the reintegration of the loved one back into the family. As I think one of the things that we learned as we were studying kind of the impact of deployment and the impact of combat exposure in particular was that there was this focus on supporting families in the lead up and during deployment, but um, not as much attention on the challenges that um, families face as they try to reintegrate that service member back into the family um, as they, you know, reestablish expectations and relationships and communication patterns um, once the, uh, the service member is back home. And, and then hearing that, and, and that can even parallel um, all transitions. Um, yes. uh, the, you know, it, the the, the common statement, of course, now the military trains us for war, but it doesn't train us to come back home. Um, you know, there's a, a nine to 15 week uh, uh, indoctrination essentially into the military through basic training and boot camp and things like that. Uh, but there's nothing uh, comparable for service members transitioning out of the military. Um, and, it, and it happens uh, very quickly. Um, and that's where a lot of the research that Rand has done is not just on, on active duty military and current, um, you know, currently serving individuals, but the impact of combat beyond uh, when a service member served in the military. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the need to continue to understand how um, mental health issues in particular may exhibit themselves later um, after that transition and um, throughout the, the life, you know, the, either the issues around delayed onset of post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms um, or delayed onset of other um, types of conditions, particularly as adjustment and transition occurs. Um, one of the interesting things that uh, we observed in doing some studies in communities was, um, you know, obviously thinking about transition not as a single um, point in time in, in a military service member's career, but um, when we were in the field and doing some work in communities, uh, one of the striking things I observed and we found uh, with the qualitative work that we were doing is that the uncertainty that was reintroduced for many veterans um, later in life as they transitioned from the workforce um, you know, to retirement status and that this was bringing up and reconjuring up some of the concerns and challenges they had when they got out of the, mil the military of, of really thinking about their identity and, and facing some of the issues and challenges that perhaps weren't addressed earlier on in their life. And so, you know, it's, I think, important to keep in mind that uh, we need to continue to understand that the mental health um, needs of the veteran population will continue um, to be of concern and should be a priority for years and decades to come. And I think that's an important point uh, for, for listeners who are veterans or those who may not be familiar uh, with the, the veteran 
um, you know, the veteran culture uh, who may be working with veterans is that late onset PTSD is uh, is a significant uh, risk. Um, you know, we we're about 25 years away from 20 to 25 years away from the um, the earliest Gulf War, uh, uh, global war on terror veterans hitting 65 years old. Right. So this is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with in about 20 to 25 years. Um, I recall some of the hearing about this in the mid 90s, where Holocaust survivors who are in their their 70s and 80s. Um, who had not shown any symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, were starting to see the symptoms of late-onset PTSD simply due to those life transitions that you're talking about. They, mm -hmm. they don't have the protective factors anymore. Uh, their family, their friends uh, are passing away. They have more time on their hands. And some of it may just be due to neurological degeneration, you know, or brains right. break down. Um, but, but that is just because a veteran is, is doing okay and, and trucking along right now, it's something we need to pay attention to because it could be a, a sleeping giant. Um, absolutely. And, and certainly if we've learned anything from the studies that have been done following the cohort of Vietnam era um, veterans is that we can expect to see, you know, several uh, years, decades um, before some of the symptoms really reach a level of um, functional impairment um, such that uh, veterans may come forward and seek treatment. So both the delayed onset of the uh, symptoms and disorder, but also probably the delay to getting help um, that we know many veterans have experienced as well. And, and that would not only impact the veteran itself, uh, himself or herself, but also uh, the veteran's family members, right? You know, I'm seeing veterans now who are in relationships um, that they didn't serve with, right? That, that their spouse or, or their family was not there during the deployments, but all they're seeing is the aftermath. Um, you know, they're, they're not experiencing that. Um, and that has an impact on the family member. And, and in 25 years, uh, that's going to, by that time, you know, <laughs> thankfully, blessedly, my, my wife and I will be married for 45 years, 50 years going on by that point. Um, and, and it's going to be a different thing for the caregivers and those people that have journeyed with the veteran throughout their life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, while there have been some studies and we've done some to look specifically at uh, the impact and the challenges and burdens associated with caregiving um, for those that are providing um, care and assistance to um, a veteran who was wounded, ill and injured, which includes, you know, a large uh, group of pre and post 9-11 veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or who may have experienced a traumatic brain injury. Um, you know, we also know that um, spouses of uh, military service members and veterans may be at increased risk for um, depression, for example, and that children of uh, military children uh, may also, well, and there have been studies to show that they have um, increased rates of major depressive um, disorder as compared to civilian um, children's the similar age. And so while, you know, we think about it as a researcher, I think about it in, in two different ways, you know, to one, to what extent uh, are these issues associated with their military life? So this family was a family during the military. They all experienced a deployment together. They experienced the transition out of the military. Um, but then you also have, um, veterans who perhaps get out of the military, aren't married, do not have families, and then they build a family, um, you know, while on veteran status. And so while that family didn't have that shared experience of the military or the deployment, um, you know, they may also be trying to understand and have the shared experience of living with a veteran who perhaps is um, dealing with the repercussions of their combat experience earlier in life. Um, and so, you know, how do we understand um, and look at the needs that those families have and how, you know, either the military experience or the experience of living with an individual who is challenged um, and suffering with um a wound, illness, or injury, and especially how um, the impact of TBI and depression among a veteran 
um, has a ripple impact in the family. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have as many studies as we need uh, to really think about um, both the size and scope of these issues, but how best to address them. And, um, you know, in thinking about supporting the families of veterans, we have to draw a lot upon the civilian literature to understand how do we help families um, with individuals that experience chronic illness, chronic disabilities, or even chronic mental health problems cope and um, get their own needs tended to so that the family can be healthy and thrive. No, I I think that is uh, absolutely a great point. Even the differentiation between Um, a a veteran who builds a family who did not experience the deployment versus uh, the one that that shared the deployment. Uh, Again, thinking uh, personally, um, you know, of course, I was not born. I was born nine months after the the last troops left Vietnam. So Mm -hmm. whatever that means, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, but I was not my father was a veteran by that time. Uh, My my older sister was born um, literally as he was leaving the army. And so we experienced Vietnam loomed large in my life, not just for my father, but for my uncles and and other people. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was never anything that I experienced directly. I experienced that aftermath. And then Mm -hmm. you have that cross-generational impact of uh, now I'm a combat veteran. My younger brother, um, who we we share the the same father, um, is now also a combat veteran. Um, in, In the cyclical impact of that, um, my children now, my son was born one month before 9-11, uh, and of mm-hmm. course, with my wife's permission and I, he could join. Um, September 12th of this year is the first wow. time that a child not born on 9-11 can join yep. the military and fight in a conflict that, was, that started before they were born. Uh, and so there's cross-generational impacts to this. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my dad served in the Navy for six years, and that was well before um, my parents were married and well before um, I was born. Uh, But, you know, it's striking that he never really spoke of his service. Um, And while we knew that he had experienced um, some type of service-related injury and and drew VA benefits, um, you know, the narrative of um, his life wasn't necessarily one of, of a, you know, a veteran, but, um, you know, obviously carrying some of that experience with him um, and likely impacted him throughout uh, the remainder of his life and his, and his other careers. Um, so, yeah, um, it's been interesting to kind of even think back historically about how um, that has had an impact on my family um, and trying to use that to understand how we really assess and think about Um, the ripple and the cyclical nature of the impacts uh, for our all-volunteer force. So, and you'd mentioned earlier about the the prevalence or the increased rates of depression, uh, both in military spouses uh, and in in military children, um, and even that research saying, hey, there's something else here, and so we as a community, but also we as individuals, veterans specifically, need to pay attention that this is dangerous or, or, you know, that there's challenges with our family members. Um, There's been a lot of research, a lot of discussion about, of course, the the suicide rate in the veteran population, um, but that that's not well known, um, the, the contagion effect or the secondary impact, uh, suicide rates that are directly impacted by um, military service in spouses um, or close family members or children, uh, that's, a, that's a research challenge maybe is how do we capture that? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And um, I don't have great answers to how to capture that, but it is um, a significant concern and question that many have um, raised. And, you know, we are just now starting to get to a point where we have much better data on understanding suicide among um, service members and veterans, and we're tracking that much more closely. And I think we do need to start to um, understand how we can assess it for um, the family members of service members and veterans. You know, we have a greater probability of being able to do that uh, for uh, individuals who are still um you know, within the active and reserve component, because the Department of Defense would have better data on all beneficiaries 
uh, within the DOD um, system. So they could um, have a greater opportunity to pair and match death records, for example, um, similar to what has been done for uh, service members and veterans. But it becomes a little bit more challenging uh, when folks leave the military because, you know, as you leave the military, you become a private citizen again. And until you begin using services and benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs, we have very few opportunities to um, understand uh, where you are, who you are, and what needs you have. And so that's even greater for their spouses and family members who are private citizens. And, you know, we aren't necessarily capturing all of the nuances of their military or veteran affiliation in medical records or in other ways that would allow us to look at some of these um, occurrences and the incidents among uh, family members uh, of veterans, um, you know, to look at, you know, issues like suicide or other types of risk beyond what we collect, um, you know, in anonymous surveys. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to do some death records matching, you would need to be able to do that with identifying information. And, you know, we have obviously to overcome some of those privacy challenges and barriers to do that. And, and I think it's significant, uh, again, and this is a lot of this is anecdotal, you know, we think we know what we know, uh, but until we actually get the, the research behind it, a, a lot of times um, it, it, what we were talking about earlier, for example, is a, a great example of, you know, we think that being in constant contact with our family may not be a very good thing, but the research actually shows, like you said, that if we set it up correctly and we manage expectations, it can actually improve. So what we know anecdotally, I believe that, that uh, you know, yes, there is a secondary impact. Uh, but until we actually get that research on ground, um, then we're not actually dealing with facts. We're just dealing, as you said, with anecdotes and, and supposition. And as we uh, go ahead. No, I was going to say knowledge is really key. I mean, knowledge and evidence is is really going to be important for informing how we create programs um, to intervene and how we create the support, but also, you know, to really inform policies more broadly. So, you know, it is really important to have that knowledge and information which can come from, you know, appropriately designed research studies. And, and a lot of the, the things, of course, that we've been talking about, and, and honestly, it's, it's some things that I, I sometimes hear um, is that uh, both, you know, here and on the blog is that, oh, we, we deal with the, the bad stuff, right? We're pe perpetuating the, the myth of the broken warrior and things like that. Uh, I'm curious to hear what kind of research has, has been done um, about protective factors or how, how uh, resilience has been developed, post-traumatic growth uh, things like that. Yeah, no, that's a great um, uh, point. And, you know, it is true that I think a lot of the research and the headlines that are grabbed tend to focus on those that have not fared as well. And, you know, for important reasons, to call attention to the needs um, to indicate that perhaps additional support services are needed for those who may be struggling. And, you know, for those that seem to be doing okay, you know, it's never um, necessary. There's, to some extent, I've heard this belief that sometimes it's like, well, if they're doing well, they're doing well, you know, they may not need that additional support. But I do think from a knowledge and an education standpoint, and, you know, the narrative, it's important to reflect um, on the stories of, um, of resilience. I think over time, over the past decade, we've certainly seen um, a greater understanding of trying to recognize and promote um, how we can um, improve resilience among troops and their families. And there was a large focus on implementing those types of programs um, and then really examining, um, you know, some of these issues across the transition cycle as well. And so while folks have been, fo you know, looking at indicators of what might be positive um, outcomes, if you will, after deployment in terms of um, employment and earnings growth, and certainly my colleagues have done a lot of work around um, those topics, 
you know, there have been studies, the deployment life study that I mentioned earlier that found that communication was a um, protective factor. We were looking at what factors were associated with people doing well, um, not just the factors associated with people who weren't doing so well. Um, and that's where we saw the, the finding about communication. Um, there are more studies now um, looking at, you know, post-traumatic growth as, as the field has adopted this uh, larger framework of trying to understand and measure well-being. Um, I think we'll, we'll begin to see more data and information um, about that broader topic and spectrum as well. And it's really important that we are more comprehensive in the types of issues and areas that we study so that we get a a better understanding of how folks are faring and how we might be able to facilitate um, some of those more positive outcomes over time. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean that we can look away from understanding those um, that may, may not do so well because we know that we may need increased interventions uh, through policies and programs to make sure that we can um, intervene early and at the right times so that we can really provide hope in ways that we weren't able to do um, in prior eras um, for our veterans. No, I, I think that is critical, and it's a conversation that we need to have to, to maintain balance. Um, an earlier conversation I had with Sally Spencer Thomas about suicide, uh, where she was lamenting the uh, the beating the drum of death data, right, you know, and, and sort of we're, we're and, and again, I've been, people have approached me about, you know, why do you just keep talking about this, uh, beating the death drum of, of PTSD data or broken data, um, that we're just trying to, you know, we're, we're trying to help those veterans that are sort of in that very high crisis moment. And there's an idea of either you're in crisis or you're not. Um, and, and you're not in crisis until you are in crisis, but there's a wide range of, you know, exactly. I'm, I'm doing really well. And maybe there's some, I'm starting to see some things in my relationship. I'm starting to see some things in my sleep or my work uh, relationships or things like that, but I'm not at crisis yet, but I can't get the support, you know, because we're, we're focusing so much on those veterans in crisis or, or really in, uh, you know, deep in addiction or struggling significantly uh, with getting their needs met. That, uh, that it's not until I get into that crisis mode that support actually happens, um, much like the Veterans Court. Once, once a veteran um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pleads guilty to a crime, the coffers are opened up uh, and all the treatment they need um, is provided. But the day before they plead guilty to a crime, yeah. that's not there. And so yeah. this idea of you know, let's, we can help concentrate on that lower range and maybe keep the veterans from getting into that crisis. Right. And absolutely. I mean, if you think about it along a continuum and, and you know, as we had to focus, um, you know, on the crisis and, you know, to really try to address um, a significant issue. Um, and certainly I think that was the major point of the study that we did in 2008 was to call attention to just the size and scope of that those folks who were really having an issue um, throughout what we've been doing in, in our work um, and trying to think about how we better create the evidence base and evaluate the programs is to get left, right? How do we get as far left of the crisis as possible and ensure that we have a continuum of data and um, with really great evidence to support how we put the supports in place and the off ramps or the interventions that need to be so that we can avoid and lower um, the probability that someone will be in crisis um, at whatever point in time. So I think we have a continued demand to continue to get left of the boom, um, as we've said often um, with our work. And, you know, how can we get upstream? How can we get left? What do we need to know? What programs need to be put in place? Um, because as, as much as we think that uh, we can alter, um, you know, our strategies and our deployment lengths and our deployment frequencies, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and other psychological and psycho psychosocial consequences are a known um, impact of war. And so as long as we're going to be deploying troops, we can expect to see um, – veterans experiencing these challenges. And so we have a commitment, I think, as a nation to continue to study and, and to get left of those crises. Um, so. And I, I like how you said that it, it is a known result 
uh, but I think there's a difference between it being a known result and being believed that it's a result, right? That um, I, I knew going in, my father was a combat veteran. We've all seen the war movies. Before I deployed, I intellectually knew what I was going to experience, but, and I've ha had veterans tell me this, uh, the first minute that you're in a firefight, now you really believe that somebody's going to try to kill you. It's no longer academic. Um, and I think the research can, can really, you know, put some, some weight behind it is say, look, it's not just something that uh, to mentally prepare for. It's something to, to really believe and emotionally prepare for um, or else uh, the cycle is going to continue. Well, and, and that's exactly, I think, the point of trying to put in some preparatory um, programs and, you know, resilience building and ensure that the systems of support are well equipped. And, and certainly, as you saw, um, you know, the change in the footprint of psychological support that has been made available over time um, uh, with the deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan have changed to try to bring those as far forward as possible to kind of um, provide additional uh, intervention opportunities, but also just support so that we can, again, get left and try to mitigate um, and address issues as early as possible so that we can perhaps um, lower the probability that individuals will have um, severe problems later. And that idea of uh, providing support as far forward as possible, it's very easy, um, well, not easy, but it's, it's possible when you have a, a cadre of trained mental health professionals that you can make them do what you want, like we did in the military, go to this base and, and do this. Um, it's more challenging to say, you know, treat the veteran where they're at in the community. Right. Um, this is uh, this is another uh, series of studies that uh, you've been involved with. That um, those mental health professionals that are in the community um, and may not be as culturally competent as those uh, you know who are in the VA and they're seeing. Uh, veterans exclusively. Yes, of course, there are veterans like myself. More of us, um, as a matter of fact, are, are veterans who are emerging into the mental health space, um, but there's a challenge in cultural competence um, for um, for mental health professionals in the community. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so, I mean, I think that um, obviously we talked about a continuum and, and thinking about um, the delivery of a continuing, a continuum of support services and interventions that might, uh, you know, help a veteran thrive. But when an individual, a veteran um, experiences um, a mental health condition is in need of mental health treatment, you know, we know that um, the VA um, has long been focused on ensuring that it has a workforce that is trained in delivering evidence-based treatments uh, for post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and other types of mental health conditions, and that they are an agency, you know, really focused on ensuring that they can offer um, that treatment in a culturally sensitive and appropriate way. But as um, we've known for a long time, you know, many veterans will um, not seek care in the VA. They will turn to community-based um, health care providers um, just out of preference or um, for convenience. Or, and so what do we know about the preparedness or the readiness of our community-based mental health workforce um, to be able to identify um these conditions and treat them with evidence-based approaches. And as you mentioned, we've done a number of studies that have tried to assess the extent to which uh, community-based healthcare professionals have training um, in the evidence-based approaches for post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. Um, the inclination to use those um, techniques in practice um, and kind of a track record of doing so, as well as how much they understand about the cultural issues and are sensitive to um, the unique nature of a veteran's experience and whether or not um, they may be able to be competent, cult you know, culturally competent um, with respect to um, understanding the veteran community. And uh, the striking thing that we found in that um, study specifically of mental health professionals is that a very low percentage of community-based mental health professionals met criteria for cultural competence um, and uh, the delivery of evidence-based care. 
um, we were able to then extend that study and look in New York State um, across a number of um, healthcare professions and just to understand the extent to which they had appropriate comfort and familiarity with treating um, conditions that are common among veterans. And again, it, and combine that with, you know, whether or not they had cultural competence and whether or not they used um, clinical practice guidelines to guide their, treat, their treatment decision making. And again, found um, a very low percentage of community-based uh, healthcare professionals that are likely to be equipped and prepared to deliver culturally sensitive, high-quality care to veterans. And so if and as uh, veterans continue to get care in the community, we have a long way to go in equipping and training and motivating um, professionals outside of the VA to um, ensure that they screen, diagnose, and treat them um, with as effectively as possible. And and that's where I think the benefit of the research can show that um, we're actually helping, um, we can help providers develop this cultural competence. We can generate cultural competence. Um, perhaps a lot of people are, um, are looking at this, uh, the, these, the results of these studies and saying, oh, well, that just means all the veterans need to go to the VA. Well, that doesn't work if they're obviously in, in rural um, you know, locations that are hundreds of miles from the VA. Or even, as you said, not only do they um, access care in the community, more likely they just simply don't access care. I'm not right. going to get it at the VA, and this person down the street isn't going to know what I'm going to deal with, and so I'm just going to avoid accessing care. And so the research can be a, a guidepost in saying, Yes, get care at the VA um, if it's available to you, and if you know if the resources are there. And if not, hey, providers in the community, if you're going to work with veterans, you absolutely need to understand what you're dealing with. Right, and there are a few tools I think that we can leverage to try to accomplish that. And so, in our studies, we've made recommendations. Um, obviously, if the VA, um, with the expansion of the community care program, might be a payer they have the opportunity to leverage and expect that um, treatment providers who would get reimbursement from the VA would need to meet some minimum expectations about their ability to deliver culturally competent um, evidence-based treatment for the health conditions that veterans experience. But as a workforce, you know, what are our state licensing and certification boards um, expecting uh, with respect to the ability to deliver this type of care for veterans, um, you know, what are the trade associations doing and training, you know, how do we influence training programs to really help, um, you know, all health professionals learn um, these skills and the nuances associated with treating different types of populations so that they can do so with competence and um, evidence-based approaches to kind of learn uh, those techniques while they're still in training and then have it reinforced uh, throughout whatever system of care that they're working in. You know, the VA continues to train a very large percentage of health professionals in the United States. So they continue to be an important training uh, setting for the U.S. healthcare system. And so ensuring um, that we reinforce these expectations from multiple points, I think, can really change U.S. healthcare system in important ways for veterans and their families. No, I, I think that is an excellent point, and I am um, I am an advocate, a proponent for service in the VA. I have many colleagues that work in the VA that I respect immensely, and they're doing good work. Um, but that idea of the VA as a training ground, uh, a couple weeks ago we had uh, uh, Dr. Philip Smith from University of South Alabama, uh, who he did his postdoc, or he did his uh, doctoral internship, uh, at a VA hospital, and now he's working with Operation Deep Dive and American Warrior Partnership uh, to be able to study community supports that would prevent veteran suicide. He had never served himself, but yet he became culturally competent in working in the VA, mm -hmm. um, in, in working with the VA rather than, you know, through lived experience perhaps um, on my own, uh, like myself. Uh, and right. so I, I think that there are many paths. It's just the the awareness that needs to be raised um, that uh, this is this is something that's going to happen. And then the the idea of the the trade associations, um, you know, American Psychological Association, the mm -hmm. American Counseling Association, which I'm a member of. 
um, we're actually um, uh, putting forth uh, military cultural competencies um, yes. that uh, that we're developing to say that anybody who is working with mental health or a mental health professional is working with veterans needs to be able to ensure that these competencies are there. Once the ACA uh, adopts that after whatever revisions we go through, uh, then that goes into graduate level programs and mm-hmm. taught as, um, you know, these are the competencies that, you know, so the doer does what the checker checks. Um, and I think a lot of that is based off of the, it's, and I know, again, specifically from, from what I've worked at, a lot of the, um, the cultural companies in the American Counseling Association are as a result of the RAND study that shows that there aren't cultural competent counselors, mental health That's great. That's yeah. great. Uh, wonderful. I love hearing that that's um, had an impact on, you know, uh, practice and will eventually change kind of how um, the expectations and training. That's fantastic. No, I, I really appreciate you taking your time this morning. Anything else that you think that uh, you want to touch on before we uh, take off here? No, I think we've covered a, a lot of topics. And so I just really appreciate your um, having me on and uh, the conversation that we've had. And this is the uh, the benefit here is you and I have had these conversations um, uh, and, and these conversations have been had individually. Uh, but I appreciate you coming out to be able to anybody can listen to this conversation uh, and sort of take this and and, uh, and act on it. So if anybody wants to reach out to you, find out more that you're doing, I'm going to make sure that uh, links to all of your research are in our show notes. But how can people reach out and connect with you? Sure. Um, email would be great. So my email address is terry, T-E-R-R-I-T, at rand.org. I'll make sure that that's in the show notes as well. Once again, I thank you for joining me for a conversation. Thank you, Dwayne, and have a good rest of your day. You're listening to Headspace and Timing on the Change Your POV Podcast Network. As comprehensive as our conversation was, you can tell that we only scratched the surface of the research that Terry and her colleagues have done regarding the health and well-being of our nation's service members and those who support them. Research can both show us what works with the problems that we have and what we need to focus on. Often, the research can inform future behavior. For example, the information she gave about communication during deployments. As long as the expectation of communication is met, then the communication is beneficial. If I told my wife we were going to talk every day and we talk every three months, then there'd be challenges. Similarly, if we say that we're going to talk rarely and we talk more often, or, as sometimes happens, a service member will tell their spouse that we'll talk rarely and someone else in the unit talks to their spouse daily, then there are also going to be challenges. Knowing what research says works in the past can make sure we do the things that work in the future. Other times, research points us in a direction where things aren't working so well, like how community providers need to make sure they're understanding how to work with veterans before they do so. As we both said during the conversation, it's not that there are no culturally competent providers, only that they're hard to come by. For veterans seeking mental health treatment, getting the right mental health provider at the right time can make a huge difference. As a matter of fact, that's something we're going to be talking about next week when we have a conversation with Matt Wettenkamp, a Marine Scout sniper and outreach specialist with the Denver Cohen Veterans Network Clinic. Getting the right care when we need it is important for veterans to live the life that they desire and deserve when they leave the military. Make sure you keep your eye out for next week's conversation. And until then, stay focused and be well. I'd like to thank the Change Your POV podcast network for hosting this show and highlighting the critical importance of veteran mental health. We want to hear from you. You can reach out to me via email at Dwayne at VeteranMentalHealth.com. You can find me at Twitter at The Counseling Vet or head on over to Facebook and look for the Change Your POV squad. You can find the show notes for this episode and all the episodes by going to VeteranMentalHealth.com or ChangeYourPOV.com. Sign up for updates on either or both so you don't miss another episode. While you're at it, check out the other great shows on the Change Your POV podcast network. The show about remembering our military history and reviving our warrior spirit, changing hearts and minds. The show about outdoor activities that us veterans love so much, Neophyte in the Woods. The show that helps us get going at the beginning of the week, Motivation Monday. And Attack Fridays, the show that brings you actionable tips, tricks, and coachable knowledge to help you make the best of your transition. While you're checking out the other shows, drop us a review in iTunes or whatever podcast platform you're listening to. The reviews really help spread the word about what we're doing. If you're looking for the total package for all the information you need to live the life you want after leaving the military, you found it. If you know of a buddy who's looking for the same info, share it with them so they can find it too. 
I want to thank Doc Todd for his permission to use his track, Not Alone, from his amazing album, Combat Medicine. Doc Todd is somebody who's trying to bring veteran mental health out of the darkness and into the light, and you can get the album by going to therealdoctod.com. Check it out, because remember, veterans, you're not alone. Ever. The struggle is real, found a piece and lost a soul Eventually my drinking, it got out of control There in darkness I roam, struggling to find home See suddenly death didn't feel so alone 22 a day, destination unknown It could have been avoided if you picked up the phone But now you're gone, so I guess all we get is the tone Nothing but bone weeds, overgrown, pushing up stones I've triumphed over enemies, co-created many knees Broke out facilities that tried to put an end to me R.I.P., I'd rather grind in tranquility Authentic Tennessee, embrace my ability from your forehead it's time man you've been through enough pain stand up it's time to stand back up all my veterans man army marine corps navy air force coast guard get up you know oh, 